Types of Intermolecular Forces, Lecture Part 2. Okay, so we're going to start a discussion of intermolecular forces and basically what they are and their relative strengths. And so I've put up a graphic here showing you from the relative weakest type of intermolecular forces to the strongest. And we're going to go through these, not necessarily in order. We're actually going to start with this one right here, dipole-dipole interactions. All right, so we'll go through all of these. We'll discuss them. We'll talk about what they are. And then in the next video, we're going to learn how to compare sets of molecules to each other and make predictions about their physical properties. Now, dipole-dipole interactions arise between polar molecules. All right, so remember, we learned how to determine whether a molecule had an overall molecular dipole. And so we, and then we call these polar molecules, and they are electrostatically attracted to each other. So remember Coulomb's law. And so we can, we can imagine that there would be an attraction between these two ends of the molecule. And it turns out that there is. Now, this partial positive and partial negative, they attract each other. And these electrostatic attractions, they operate only at short distances. So the molecules have to be pretty close together in order to feel this attraction for each other. Okay, so when we're thinking about dipole-dipole interactions, it makes sense that the most favorable arrangement for these interactions would be head to tail. So it makes sense that the partial negative would want to line up as close as possible to the partial positive. So this is going to maximize the interaction. And these chains mainly exist in liquids and solids. All right, now next we're going to talk about dispersion forces, which are also called London forces. They're also called Van der Waals forces. And so in order to really understand them, we need to think about the concept of polarizability. And basically, polarizability is just the ease with which the electron cloud can be distorted by a nearby charge. So remember, the electron cloud has a negative charge. And so if you bring another charge near to it, then if the charge is a negative charge coming close, that will repel it and it will move away. Or if it's a positive charge coming toward it, it'll be attracted to it. And so this is this polarizability of this fluffy electron cloud. You can kind of think of it that way to get a picture in your head. Now, there are certain categories of molecules or ions that have very high polarizability or higher, relatively speaking, than to others. And, that, and one is heavy atoms or ions. So these guys have lots of loosely held electrons. And so you have a big heavy atom with lots of electrons and the valence electrons are far away from the nucleus, this makes the electron cloud easy to distort. So if you bring a charge near it, then it, it'll move away. It makes it easy to distort because the electrons are not held tightly. Now, another type of molecule that exhibits high polarizability is one with pi bonds. So remember what a pi bond is. So we have electron density above and below the bond axis. So electrons in pi bonds are above and below this bond axis. And that makes it easier to distort that electron cloud with a nearby charge. Other types of molecules or ions that have high polarizability are large molecules, so lots of electrons. So it doesn't have to be just a single atom. It can also be something like carbon tetrafluoride versus methane. Many more electrons are in this molecule, and that makes it more polarizable and larger than methane. Now, dispersion forces, or these London forces, or Van der Waals forces, they involve a momentary random fluctuation in this electron density. Okay, So the electron density, the electron cloud, surrounds the molecule ion or atom, and there's a random fluctuation that can happen. And it's just momentary, and it's random. Now, these are the weakest of all intermolecular forces. Another descriptive term for these Van der Waals forces is instantaneous dipole-induced dipole. 
And so that that's another way to describe it. So it's an instantaneous dipole in one molecule induces a dipole in a neighbor. Okay, so here's a little picture of what I'm talking about. So let's say this is the original atom, okay? So this big fluffy xenon atom right here. All right, now his electron cloud just instantaneously shifts just because, all right, it's random, it's momentary. So as this random fluctuation happens, we have this negative charge associated with the xenon electron cloud. It repels this neighboring xenon electron cloud because remember, they're both negative, and so that's a repulsive interaction. Now, another type of intermolecular force is something called a dipole induced dipole attraction. Now, these are only going to happen in a mixture, okay? So you have to have a polar molecule. So you have to have a, a substance that has a permanent molecular dipole, and it's going to be in a mixture with a substance that does not have a, a permanent molecular dipole. In other words, it's a nonpolar substance, nonpolar. So this polar substance induces a dipole in the neighboring nonpolar substance. A good picture to explain this is if we take HCl, which we already talked about, has partial positive end of the mo molecule and a partial negative. So if we take this partial negative end and we bring this molecule closer to xenon, to xenon's electron cloud, it's going to shift to get away from it because it's a repulsive interaction. Negative and this negative electron cloud. So it's going to shift to try to get away from that incoming negative charge and it distorts the electron cloud. So this is a dipole. So there's a molecule with a permanent dipole induced dipole interaction. All right, now we have talked about three of the intermolecular forces on our list. Now, the reason why I left these other two is that they're kind of, they're easiest to think of as just a special case of dipole-dipole. Okay, so hydrogen bonding and then ion dipole. Now ion dipole interactions are going to be very important in unit 13 when we get there. We'll be talking about solutions in unit 13. Okay, so let's talk about ion dipole interactions first. Now remember, these are electrostatic interactions, okay, except for now we have a substance that has a full charge or more, okay, so that's on an ion, and then some sort of uncharged polar molecule. So remember, this polar molecule is going to have a partially negative end and a partially positive end, but overall it doesn't have a permanent charge. It doesn't have a charge on the molecule. It's neutral. It just has a partial positive end and a partial negative end. So um, it's still an electrostatic interaction, and the most common example of this ion dipole interaction is when we dissolve sodium chloride in a polar liquid like water. So let's go to the next slide and we'll see what it looks like. So here we dissolve sodium chloride in water and the sodium cation interacts in an ion dipole interaction with these partial negative charges on water molecules. And the chloride anion interacts with the partial positive hydrogens in these water molecules. And so that's called solvation. Ions are solvated, surrounded, and attracted with electrostatic interactions toward this permanent charge on the ion. Now, these ion dipole attractions are stronger if the charge on the ion increases, all right, so if it has a higher charge, or if the magnitude of the dipole on the polar molecule increases. So for instance, water is a very polar substance, so that would be quite a strong interaction. Now these interactions, as I mentioned, are very important in solution chemistry, so we're going to be talking about that soon in the next unit. All right, so our last intermolecular force that we're going to talk about is hydrogen bonding. Now, as I mentioned, this is a special class of the strongest dipole-dipole attractions and it is a very strong intermolecular attraction. It is not as strong as a covalent bond, however, okay? But they're strong 
These hydrogen bonds are very strong because hydrogen is small, and so it allows really close approach of the dipoles. And so remember that this electrostatic attraction depends on distance apart, and the interaction falls off very quickly at larger distances. So the closer they are, the stronger the interaction. And so that's why hydrogen bonds are so strong. Now, there are a couple of conditions that we have to have for hydrogen bonding. The interaction in a hydrogen bond is between a donor dipole, okay? So we're going to have a hydrogen bonded to some really electronegative element and a lone pair on a highly electronegative atom, okay? So this is the interaction that we're going to be looking at. It's the interaction between a lone pair and the very partial positive hydrogen that has its electron density kind of drawn away toward this highly electronegative atom that it is bonded to. Now, here's a picture of this interaction. So these tend to be linear with this shared hydrogen closer to the donor. Okay, so this is the donor hydrogen. This is the lone pair. Okay, and so this is the hydrogen bonding interaction. Okay, so just remember, hydrogen bonds are not chemical or covalent bonds. They're held together by electrostatic attractions. They're much weaker than covalent bonds, but they are a very strong intermolecular attraction. Okay, so what we're going to do in the next one is take sets of molecules and we're going to compare strengths of intermolecular forces between them. And we're going to predict properties like boiling point, melting point, and vapor pressure of the two molecules relative to each other. So we're going to compare. We're going to analyze sets of molecules and figure out which one has the stronger intermolecular attractions and hence should have higher boiling point, higher melting point, or lower vapor pressure.